Hello, and welcome again to the Emergency Medicine Clinics podcast. I'm Colleen Dietzler, the Managing Editor of Emergency Medicine Clinics here at Elsevier. Emergency Medicine Clinics is a quarterly publication consisting of review articles focused on a central topic. Today, we will be discussing a recent issue titled Pediatric Emergency Medicine. Joining us today are the guest editors of this issue, Dr. Sean Fox and Dr. Dale Woolridge. Uh, Great. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, Obviously, uh, I think Dale and I are uh, honored to be um, uh, editing this, and uh, both of us actually see adults and children, and it's, I think, one of the highlights of our uh, clinical lives is taking care of kids. It's, I think, a a privileged, um, and it's a lot of fun taking care of kids. It's a time when you're able to actually do the majority of your examination while playing, uh, which is not often uh, a useful strategy when taking care of adults. They usually frown upon that. But while it's fun, I think it does cause a fair amount of concern for a lot of our colleagues. Uh, The concept of the pediatric patient in the emergency department in the emergency department is many times uh, fraught with some fear and certainly can be challenging. Why can it be challenging? It's because kids can come in and uh, look pretty well and then do really poorly. They can be subtly sick and they can obscure their illness in a variety of ways. And additionally, more often than not, kids are pretty well. So you become uh, complacent or there's at least the potential for providers to become complacent. I'm always seeing the same presentations of nonspecific fevers and runny noses and coughs, but somewhere in that crowd, somewhere in that group of kids is someone who's trying to be sneaky and someone who is actually covertly ill. And because of that, uh, we have many times been taught the mantra of uh, kids aren't little adults and that we need to uh, think differently when it comes to children. And I, at least myself, am not a big fan of that statement because it many times, while it is meant to uh, bring about a, a, an appreciation for the anatomy and the physiologic differences that children possess that warrant concern and warrant um, appreciation, it more often than not gives people uh, a, an escape clause. Hey, I don't take care of kids. Kids are weird. They're little aliens. And I'd rather not continue to engender that fear. I'd rather make sure that we empower our colleagues, empower ourselves to know that we are able to deal with the challenge of taking care of kids and um, address those different anatomy and different physiologic um, differences so that we can ensure we're providing the most excellent care for our patients regardless of their age and regardless of where we're caring for them, whether it's in a large community center, a um, center in the middle of um, a rural area, or a center in um, you know another country. I don't care where you're seeing them. I just want to make sure that the child is getting the best care possible. And with that in mind, Dale and I kind of composed uh, some of the, the topics that we often will encounter in our emergency departments with respect to kids. And we are fortunate enough to uh, coerce uh, some of our experts in our field to chime in and, and lend their um, approach uh, and uh, knowledge base so that we could all be uh, better and more armed to take care of these children. I, I couldn't have said it better. Actually, you may have to delete that line. Um, uh, uh, thanks, Sean, for that great introduction. I, I think your and I opinion um, uh, aligns wholeheartedly. You know, it's it's a natural progression of, of most uh, uh, clinical providers, irrespective of of their um, uh, of their of their own focus or or profession, is to start with the adult population, and we learn our skill set on the adult population. It's those of us who prefer pediatric care who then learn the differences of pediatrics, and it's not that there is uh, entirely different physiology; it's just there are different. They're a different patient population. We need to appreciate those differences. And I think that's the natural progression. So at our residency program here in Arizona, we really emphasize that concept of you have a skill set. 
Now let's pl apply it to a different type of patient. Um, and that's really the heart of the matter of what we tried to get to in, in assembling this uh, uh, clinics publication. And it was a really fun project, you know, um, not known to either the publisher or the readers themselves, uh, is that Sean and I go way back all the way to residency and uh, uh, being reunited to be able to work on this project together and gather people that we have uh, learned to respect nationally to write on their specific topics that they have authority on um, was a lot of fun, a lot of work, um, but I, I, I think the reader is going to really enjoy the product that we put together here um, and uh, can't thank uh, clinics enough for uh, allowing us the opportunity. Great. Well, thank you both so much for um, that introduction. Um, and of course, we are thrilled to have you both on board. Um, so let's just go right in. Um, so you divided your issue into two sections, uh, common conditions and critical conditions. So let's start with the common. Um, the first article is uh, relating to dehydration in children. Can you give us um, some of the key takeaways regarding evaluation and management of dehydration? Well, first off, the, the concept of critical versus common as far as subdividing um, uh, the publication I, was Sean's idea. I think um, um, hats off to him because, you know, that's the reality of pediatrics is the majority of our patient populations come in for these common things, but it's the sick ones that really scare the heck out of you. Um, and I think we have a really good balance in our, in our subject matter as far as the topics are concerned to really getting into the nuts and bolts of some of these sick kids, but making sure we do a good summary of the, of the common conditions. And I think that's a perfect example in the dehydration chapter. Dehydration in the emergency department um, is a very common complaint in, uh, for pediatric patients. Um, I, I think the, the hardest part for the clinician is recognizing them. And uh, Dr. Rose um, and uh, Santalanis uh, did a perfect job, I think, at summarizing some of the key features that we need to focus on to recognize the dehydration. Uh, then they went into, I think, a very, um, a very structured manner of here's how you can rehydrate, uh, whether it be an oral route or subcutaneous or IV fluids. Um, you know, the, the stuff that we've learned in the past, but really put it into that grassroots type environment of here's how you apply it and here's how we can use it to hydrate our kids and hopefully be able to discharge them home. I would agree with that wholeheartedly, uh, Dale. And, um, you know, while it is a common thing, that doesn't mean that we always do a great job of it, right? And and that's part of um, the delineation between the two. Many times emergency uh, practice focuses on the the super scary and the super um, exciting, and that ends up being the kind of critical topics, and, and therefore those gain a lot of uh, highlights and a lot of news and uh, notoriety. But it's the common things that affect your day and your shift, probably the greatest, without a doubt. And if we're not doing them correctly, we also have the greatest impact uh, potentially to cause um, potential harm. So with respect to dehydration, you know, if we're just slamming IVs in all these kids, um, we're, we're not actually doing what would be in their best interest uh, for the most part, knowing how to delineate which child will be benefited uh, by oral re rehydration therapy and which would actually mandate some more aggressive therapies. And are there other therapies, like you said, like subcutaneous fluids or even NG fluids? Uh, I find that you know, the topic of oral rehydration therapy and dehydration in general is one that while uh, we encounter commonly, many of us still get a little bit sidetracked on because we feel like if I just put the IV in, it will be faster. Oh, and guess what? That's not true. Actually, we can get kids out of the emergency department faster if we do oral rehydration therapy. Okay, great. Um, so from there, um, let's move on to the bronchiolitis article. Um, the authors take us uh, from clinical practice guidelines through to clinical practice. Can you just summarize uh, the main points of this paper? I know they talk a lot about the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, bronchiolitis clinical practice guideline, and they review some recent literature. So what are your thoughts on that, and what are the, some of the key takeaways from that article? 
So once again, bronchiolitis. I mean, we are uh, always dealing with a onslaught of little children who are having respiratory distress that is likely related to a viral condition, most likely leading to bronchiolitis. And it can cause a lot of problems. Um, it is not always an innocuous condition. And we need to be uh, very mindful of while it's common doesn't mean that it is a simple process. Um, it's actually a quite a dynamic process. And the authors highlight that here. And, and what they also highlight is that in 2014, we did have um, practice guidelines that were published that in the end kind of summate to uh, you should just do supportive care. Um, the problem that that creates is when I got a patient presenting who is, you know, a six month old who's breathing 65 times a minute and has a lot of respiratory distress, just patting them on the head and, um, you know, making sure that uh, they're not hypoxic doesn't always work out on an individual basis. And what the authors did here was kind of address some of the concepts of managing these children um, and being able to uh, know the data behind uh, the, the practice guideline and, and where some deviations from the guideline may be appropriate uh, so that you can actually practice medicine and not just follow a guideline. Yeah, I, I, I agree totally. Um, you know, I, I think the authors, um, uh, you know, you, you know you got a good product when you walk away and are adjusting your own practice. <laughs> and when the AAP recommendations came out in 2014, it kind of flew in the face from a lot of the habits that you had in treating bronchiolitis. So for the old guys who have a bunch of gray hair like me, it was one of those scenarios where I don't know if I necessarily wanted to give up my old dogma of how I treat this. Um, but the authors here did a really good job at summarizing the rationale um, and the fact that we know clinically that some of these therapies just don't work so well. Um, but put it in kind of a common sense format of, of you know, here's our strategy um, and we're going to do what, what helps and uh, here's our patient population where evidence just really doesn't show that it does but gives that physician um, the guidelines on on how to at least approach that new uh, co that new approach, that new concept to the treatment of bronchiolitis. Um, so this was a chapter that I walked away with uh, really appreciating the author's work. Okay. Um, so uh, Dr. Holmes' article covers pediatric minor head injury. Um, can you talk a bit about clinical decision-making and risk stratification as it relates to minor head trauma? You know, this is something that we have been uh, wrestling with for a long time now. And um, and while my hair may not be as gray as Dale's, it's, it's pretty gray. And um, I know that the practice has evolved uh, even over this past decade. And a lot of that owes it, uh, owes uh, is owed to the um, large uh, group of work done by the PCARN uh, research group and looking at how to risk stratify the child who has uh, low mechanisms and helping to further decide and give um, tools to the practitioners to determine who is going to um, be at low risk for significant intracranial injury and help mitigate unnecessary CT radiation. Understanding that there's lots that get involved in the those equations and um, the chapter here, I think Dr. Homan does a nice job of giving additional resources, giving a, us additional tools because the conversations that you have with those families about why you um, believe a child doesn't need a head CT for their little um, head bonk, many times uh, are difficult just because you're having a hard time interpreting what you know to be true from very extensive research. Well, this um, chapter helps us with additional tools that not only um, help further our understanding, but actually can be applied and translated a little bit more easily to our patients and their families. 
Yeah, I, I, I echo that. I mean, the, the, the concept um, of shared decision making with the family uh, that Dr. Homie really emphasizes through the chapter. Um, in, in that, it, it's, a, it's a perfect tool for these patients that are a little bit confounding. Um, it's a minor head injury, but, uh, um, but, but can be subtle in its presentation when there becomes a con a further concern. And I think it really breaks it down really well to kind of applied concepts of what the physician can take to the workplace and apply. Um, so you, Dr. Homie did a great job. Um, and I think if I could maybe jump, jump list a little bit, and it segues perfectly to our chapter on imaging gently, because the rationale to, um, uh, I think more of a clinical approach to the minor head injury and avoiding further imaging, um, really lends itself to that image gently approach that um, Dr. Pachowski and McGill um, had uh, w uh, worked a chapter on um, and really put that together as an approach of, of all using, you know, uh, evidence-based uh, approach to avoiding um, uh, further radiation, um, or at least through the judicious use of uh, imaging studies. Um, so again, very good nuts and bolts. You, you take it into the trenches with you and you apply it. Uh, great chapters. So Dr. Schunk and Dr. Rutten, uh, their article deals with approaching pediatric syncope. Uh, could you explain a bit about the condition and review the recommendations for the evaluation of children presenting with syncope? Uh, the authors on this chapter, um, I think, put a, put, gave a real common sense approach towards, you know, those high risk conditions that can be associated with syncope. Um, uh, allowing the physician, I think, the full uh, understanding that the majority of these cases are benign in nature, um, but it's those ones that can be life-threatening that we need to keep an eye out on. And they had some really good table elements, I think, that summarized these concepts um, and talked about the individual disease processes um, in which we needed to be fully aware of uh, and, and to be able to trigger further intervention. Um, so again, a, a good approach, a good summary, um, and a good discussion of the pathophysiology in, in, in a condition which in, uh, for a large part is benign, but, uh, but can be really devastating if we miss those, uh, those more significant cases. Yeah, this is another one of those uh, topics that is um, all too common, um, often uh, leading to some complacency and uh, we need to be sensitive to the fact that there are some patients lurking that have some underlying conditions that may present with them having just simple syncope, and they're going to present just like the other teenager that had syncope that has no medical problems and has no underlying condition. And how do we find them? How do we sort them out? And that's what I think that this chapter is most useful for, is helping us to look for those needles in the haystack, if you would, um, finding those red flags and then appropriately evaluating them. So not being fearful of them and not over-testing everybody. Um, everybody doesn't need a CT scanner of their chest to look for PE. This is, you know, not that po patient population at large. But what are the simple strategies we can use to make sure that we're screening this population appropriately and looking for those um, individuals that are presenting commonly but maybe uh, have a, an obscured uh, medical condition that warrants our concern. So I wanted to move on to some of the more critical conditions in the issue. Um, the first two articles in this section deal with ventilation, uh, both non-invasive and invasive. Could you just talk a little bit about the differences between them? Certainly. This is, you know, where um, emergency physicians feel like they um, shine, in all honesty. We, we are uh, well-trained and have a unique set of skills, and uh, one of those significant skills is managing acute respiratory emergencies. And unfortunately, on occasion, that's going to require advanced airway techniques such as utilization of non-invasive ventilation or unfortunately even in other patients uh, require intubation and, and um, further ventilation management. 
the skill set of um, non-invasive ventilation uh, is more uh, a cognitive one, one that you, you have to uh, put your brain around when uh, these patients uh, who present with respiratory illness uh, may benefit from the uh, assistance of a, a non-invasive ventilation mode, such as BiPAP or CPAP, or uh, now we're using a lot of um, um, humidified high-flow nasal cannula, which also uh, would kind of fit in this realm a little bit. And uh, helping to not just slap that on as a bandage and walk away, but actually being able to continue to assess your patient and discern whether you're having improvement and we're able to um, actually avoid intubation or whether we need to move on uh, from that modality because we're not successfully uh, reducing their work of breathing or improving their ventilation status. When we consider the, the act of intubation, a lot of my residents that I have here um, and that we encounter uh, across the country uh, are very interested in, in the mechanics of intubation, right? The, the physical skill of intubation. But that is really the, the smallest part. And it's a scary part. And one, when we deal with children, um, warrants even more concern because of those anatomy issues that we have different from our adults. And also, by the way, significant physiologic differences. These little kids uh, have a very high metabolic rate, have low functional residual capacity, are much more prone to desaturate, are also much more prone to have um, post-intubation complications. And it's the appreciation of that uh, that allows us, I think, to um, go beyond just the mechanics, the, the, the mechanical skill, and move into the cognitive skill of managing these children because anticipating those pitfalls before they occur will help us avoid them. And um, the, the chapter on uh, pediatric ventilation uh, really addresses, okay, you've had to do this, now what? Because you're going to, you can't just walk away from the ventilator because these children are in um, the most critical position uh, right after intubation. And we need to know how to manipulate the machine that's helping keeping them alive right now. So that about wraps up uh, my questions. Did you have any final thoughts uh, on the issue as a whole that you wanted to share? Um, you know, I think that both of us have um, had, uh, you know, a, a wonderful opportunity um, to uh, envelop ourselves in uh, a unique community of uh, not just emergency medicine, um, which I think is a, an awesome community unto ourselves, but also the, the pediatric emergency community uh, is filled with just wonderful um, practitioners who uh, really um, are not just aiming to take great care of kids, but are also very invested in helping to educate everybody because, again, the main goal is I don't care where you came from. I don't care where the kid's being seen. I just want to make sure that um, your level of expertise is met by a level of comfort dealing with that child so that the child can get um, profoundly excellent care. And these, um, not just uh, amazing people, but award-winning clinicians um, help uh, disseminate this information. So, you know, uh, certainly um, I would... Uh, uh, be willing to um, hang out with uh, these people and talk um, endlessly about their projects and um, how better we can um, take care of kids. Thank you for joining us for this edition of the Emergency Medicine Clinics podcast. For an exclusive discount on the issue we discussed today, focusing on pediatric emergency medicine, visit us.elsevierhealth.com slash EMC podcast. Emergency Medicine Clinics is available for individual print subscription with accompanying electronic access and can be accessed on the Elsevier electronic platforms, Clinical Key, and Science Direct. A CME program is also available. For more information, visit info.theclinics.com. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at emedclinics and subscribe to the Emergency Medicine Clinics podcast on iTunes. Recent issues of emergency medicine clinics have focused on observation medicine, vascular disasters, and trauma resuscitation.